covers my sin Each time I come into your presence I stand in wonder once a oh, Sunday morning or Saturday afternoon or evening depending on your location this is the present truth of where by the grace of God we've been giving in-depth analysis into the second quarter's edition of the adult Sabbath school study guide we have walked a long journey and every project has a beginning it has an end pretty soon this wonderful discussion will come to an end and we enter into a new quarter but before that Today, we're going to look at lesson 10. Last week, we talked about a city of confusion. And we admonish that you come to the wonderful city of Zion, come to the city of Jerusalem, which is the new Jerusalem, the new city that God is preparing for his people in Revelation chapter 21 and Revelation chapter 22, where there is no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain. Sin has been eradicated. Death has been eradicated. Today, we look at some of the deceptive practices taking place in this city of confusion, in this harlot system of worship, in this false system of worship. The book of Revelation is calling us to come out of that particular system. Last week, we ended on a very good note, calling all our listeners, calling our viewers, calling all our lovely friends who are in that system of false worship to come out of hell and not be drunk with her wine. Today, we look at two principal deceptive practices. There are so many of them, but we look at two principal ones that are taking the world by storm. But before we go into in-depth discussion, we will ask Elder Michael or Seb Watin to give us the open prayer. Shall we pray? Lord Almighty, we bless your name for giving us this privilege to study your word. We are here asking for your grace and mercies. We ask for your divine wisdom and understanding of your word. We are praying for our listeners that Lord, May you give us all the strength and understanding of your word. Be with us now and forevermore. We do believe that after calling your holy name, you will be with us and your glory and your name will be blessed. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for this time of discussion. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for gathering us here in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that I pray. Amen. Amen. With me today to do the discussion is as usual, Brother Damian Brown. I have Brother Nyeren Dakepemba. I have Brother Herari Delight Tundrai. And we have Elder Michael Osei Boatin. We have our lovely sister who is helping us behind the scenes. She has been doing all the wonderful designs. She's been doing the graphics. So we want to say God bless her. And very soon he will also join us live to do some of these discussions. Sister Nicole will soon also join us on this panel. And I think the family is, is growing bigger and bigger day in and day out. We're looking at some of these deceptive practices that the devil has thrown into Christendom and it's taking the whole world by storm. It's taking the whole world by storm. Satan's final deceptions. Don't forget, Christ warned us against the deception as he talked about the event that will precede his second advent. That even if it is possible or if it were possible, you even deceive the very elect. Deception, as I said at that time, is a, a dangerous game. Especially when the person pretends to love you. Always say, I love you, I love you. And later on, you find out that that person is a high lot. That person has given you a wife. Everybody who is drunk, you know the consequences. That person cannot think straight. That person can lie in the street and in the gutters and be thinking that 
he is lying on his wonderful apartment. That person is tossed about by every wind of doctrine. Remember, any church or denomination that places its constitution, traditions, creed, beliefs above the Bible is a false and apostate church. And as Christ said, in vain they worship me, teaching me doctrine, the commandment of man. And in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20, we are told to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this, it is because there's no light in them. The doctrines of traditions, the doctrines of men, Christ warned in Mark chapter 7, verse 7 to 8. Truth is hard, but it saves. Let us take the key text for today. And it's a very short text, but it's packed with so much nuggets. In John chapter 17, verse 17, it's one of my favorite texts. Christ said, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. The word is faithful. The word is Jesus Christ. The word has a cleansing and a saving power. If we are sanctified by thy law, then we are rest assured. Writer of this lesson gave us a very fascinating story, and it relates so well to what we'll be discussing this morning, this afternoon, this evening. It is one of those gorgeous sat September morning in Chicago as the sun rose over Lake Michigan. And Comethes, Bethel traffic jams on the Kennedy and Enshover Expressways, and children made their way to school. A chilling story began to emerge that struck fear into the heart of the Chicagoans. People were becoming tragically sick, and some were dying just a few hours after taking talenoid capsule. If you don't know, talenoid is one of these analgesics. Uh, the equivalent in my country would be the paracetamol and the family. On testing, each of the capsules proved to be laced with potassium cyanide, a deadly poison. A deranged individual had tempered with the medication, and today, They've not been able to identify who did that. It as we have seen, Revelation warns us that the inhabitants of the earth will drink a deadly poison called the wine of Babylon. And last week, we all came to the conclusion that this wine is the false doctrine, the false theology that the devil is given to the end time people. He started in the Garden of Eden and has continued to date because that has been very, very efficacious. There are false doctrines and teachings that in the end will lead only to death. However, the world is not left without the antidote. Remember those who took the potassium cyanide, even though they could not identify the one who did that wicked act. Here, the Bible has given us an identifying mass. It has mention who this particular individual is. There are false doctrines and teachings, as I've already said, that will only lead to death. However, the world is not left without an antidote. The protection against this spiritual poison, the three angels' messages in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 to 12. The first angel's message in Revelation chapter 6 and 7. The second one in Revelation chapter 8. The third one in Revelation chapter 9 and 10. And then John concluded by telling us who will stand there. Those who keep the commandments of God and have what? The faith of Jesus. They have the faith. It's not that they are in the faith. They have that faith, that enduring faith. In this week's lesson, we will continue with our exploration on the Babylonian deceptions that Jesus' plan which is his GPS, the gospel of salvation, should be our bl blueprint. That should be our model and our moral compass to save us from them and the death they will otherwise be. I'm going to highlight on these two deceptive practices of the ancient Babylon that the spiritual Babylon is relying on. Babylon the Great, in the book of Revelation, designated in a special sense the united apostate religions at the close of probation. These are the Protestant 
apostate religions. Babylon the Great is the name by which inspiration refers to the great fried food religious union of the papacy, the apostate Protestant community, and spiritism. In Revelation chapter 16, verse 13, you see that three unclean spirits, like flocks, coming out of the dragon. The term Babylon refers to organizations themselves and to their leaders, and not so much to the members as such. That's why we gave that caveat, the other lesson, that we are not referring to the individuals that are the most of them are sincerely worshipping. Most of them are genuinely, and they are performing their duties very well. But the system is what is deceiving them. The system is that is giving them that wine, and we are calling them out of that system into true worship with the Savior. The Bible refers them to as many warfare. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 1 and 15, through the two great errors, and what are these errors? The immortality of the soul, and then Sunday sacredness. Satan will bring the people under his deception. While the former lays the foundation of spiritism, the latter create a bond of sympathy with Rome. Read the book, The Great Controversy, page 580. Grab a copy of that book because it talks so much. It throws more light on the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel, an end time event that you will not be, be surprised and have so much to learn from. In the Old Testament, the spirit of the dead played a major role in the Babylonian religion. The Babylonians held a strong belief in the doctrine of the immortality of the soul. They believed that at death, the soul entered the spirit world. The immortal soul concept is foreign to biblical teaching. The Jewish encyclopedia clearly identifies the origin of the false idea of the immortality of the soul. And this is how it, it captures it. They believe that the soul continues its existence after the dissolution of the body is nowhere expressly taught in the Holy Script. They believe in the immortality of the soul came to the Jewish from a contact with Greeks, specifically through the philosophy of Plato, its principal proponent, who was led to it through Orphanic and Eleusinian mysteries in which Babylonian and Egypt views were strongly blended. It can be dangerous. This is from Kaufman's co-less book, Immortality of the Soul, 1906. Here is a remarkable statement by Dr. Edward T. Hasko, the author of the Standard Manual for the Baptist Church. And let us hear from this source. In 1893, he addressed a group of hundreds of Baptist ministers and shocked them as he explained how Sunday came into Christian church. He said, what a pity it's that is Sunday comes branded with the mark of paganism and Christianized with the name of the Son God, then adapted and sanctified by the Papa apostasy and quitted as a sacred legacy to the Protestants. Before the New York Ministers' Conference, November 13, 1893, was this particular statement made. I will not waste much time. I will invite one of our main speakers, Brother Kapemba, to help us know the way that seems right. But in the eyes of man, by the end thereof, a person in deep trouble. It land the person in death. It land the person in eternal destruction. The way that seems right in the sight of man. Man's ways are, can never be right. It takes only the ways of Christ to be right. Brother Kapemba, help us. I said this particular lesson. I get so excited when we are talking about these things because they border on salvation. Thank you. Thank you, Elder. Greetings, viewers, and welcome back to our lesson today. Remember, we are looking at Revelation, and we start with Revelation 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel, and to his servant John. We are learning this revelation. We're not here to scare anyone. It's the, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
and we know Jesus Christ is our Savior. Before he left, Jesus Christ made prophecy of what is going to happen as the world is coming to an end. In Mark 13, 22, he says, For false Christs and false prophets will ar arise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So Jesus is saying, in the last days, and we believe we are living in the last days, he says there will be false prophets who will perform wonders, and they are performing these signs and wonders to deceive who? Even the elect, it says, but then who are these elects? If we go in Matthew 24, verse 31, Jesus says, and he will send his angels, that is during his second coming, and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather unto his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So elect, we know God's people, the ones that belong to Christ. So it says, in the last days, there will be false prophets and false Christ who will deceive and if possible even those that belong to God. You see that this deception is so subtle. This deception is so that even those that are elect, we praise God that he will be there for them, but even them would have been deceived as well. Who is Satan going to deceive? We are laying the foundation of this lesson. Who is he going to deceive? Because we know Satan is the deceiver in all this. So Revelation 12 verse 9 says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of God called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So whom is he coming for? The whole world. Not a select, not any church, not one church, not one uh, rest. The whole world, the devil is aiming for the whole world. He's coming to deceive the whole world. But then are we left without uh, any hope? Remember in the introduction, as Elder Ajiman uh, was introducing, this week we are going to learn about the deception that the devil has planned. But besides that, we are also going to learn the, uh, the plans that Christ has set in place to save us. It's a two-way thing. We learn of his deception, but the good part is we also learn of the plan that Christ has made for us because he's made a good plan for us. Now, I want us to read Proverbs 14, verse 12, and hear what it says. This is one of the weapons being used to deceive many people. And Proverbs 14, verse 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And most people often, they will tell you, no, follow your conscience. If you're trying to make a decision, they will encourage you, no, what do you think about it? No, sit down and follow your own conscience. But then... Proverbs is telling us that uh -uh, this way is not good. There is a way that you may think seems right to you, but the end of it leads unto death. What does Jeremiah say regarding uh, human heart? It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So, <clears throat> when people tell you not, you should believe your conscience, trust your conscience. Uh, the Bible is telling us, be careful with that. The heart is deceitful above all things. Check again. You don't want to believe your conscience. What is the antidote then? What should we do uh, if the devil has come to deceive the world and we cannot trust our own conscience? Then who can we trust? We have the word of God. The word of God is the light unto our path. And Christ came. He says, if you light up a candle, you don't hide it. You put, a, you put it to an open place so that the light can be seen. He came. He's the example. He's the light. And he's given us the light also to go into the world and preach to everyone. So we need to read the word of God, hear the word of God, and we'll be blessed, just like Revelation says, we'll be blessed if we listen to his word, read his word, and do the things of this book. So that is the introduction to our lesson today. Thank you very much, and I leave it to other presenters. Elder Ajman, take it up. Thank you so much. That is the only light. That is our moral compass. That gives us a marching order. You cannot say you are a good Christian when you don't read your Bible. You know, that's the deception out there. People don't read the Bible. People don't read even their religious, own religious to know what they believe or what their church talks about. When it, is it in a hoot with the Bible? Is it going in sync with what the Bible gives? We will give our next speaker the chance to help us understand this dimension the old lie of immortality. I talked about these two prominent lies that the devil is going to use or is using as we speak. And most of them are on that path to destruction. They've left that narrow path. 
that Christ talked about. Most of the people will be on the broad highway, and a few of them will be on the narrow highway. So we invite Brother Tundrai to help us understand what this lie that was told is still subtly deceiving many in our cultures, in our religion, in the movie industry. Everywhere you see this deception, and people believe that when you die, you have not actually died. But I think I can help us with that. Thank you. Thank you, Elder, very much for this uh, opportunity. And uh, thank you, uh, Brother Kampava. I want to thank the Lord for this study that has come to us, especially in these times that we are living. The Lord is beseeching us that we might know the present truth, the truth of our times. Monday is talking about the old lie of immortality. Before we go into the lesson, there are a pair of verses we're going to read together. The first one is from Revelation chapter 16, verse 13 to 14, and I'll read in your hearing. It says, And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, number one, out of the mouth of the beast, number two, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Three clean and spirits like frogs, for they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Before I go to the next verses, let us explain a little things that we have seen. Monday now begins with scary events, dragons, beasts, and even some of these things you might think are scary and unclean. It defines them as unclean. I think we have established before we have learned the dragon, who is the dragon, who is the devil himself. The best is presented by a power, authority, and false prophet I've read, we've read together from the book of Revelation chapter 18, I'm sure, where we see a second beast rising who's also tamed as the false prophet. And in him, he has the power to deceive. He's like flesh. But what is similar to these three powers is that there is coming out of them three unclean spirits like frogs. Why like frogs? For they are evil spirits, demonic spirits. And what they can do, they can deceive. That is their power. And these three powers, we can see there are the trinity of the devil. And as we go on to the next part, which is Revelation chapter 18, verse 2. And he said, and he called out with a mighty voice. So what was the voice saying was, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. And we have already established last week, I'm sure, that Babylon is the city, a great spiritual kingdom of confusion, of sin. And she says, become a dwelling place for demons. This is Babylon, a haunt of every unclean spirit, a haunt of every unclean bird, a haunt of every unclean and stable beast. Babylon itself has become like a cage where it keeps every unclean spirit. And Revelation chapter 18, 23, it says now, and the light of the lamb will shine in you no more. And the voice of the bride, the voice of Christ, the voice of the bridegroom will be heard in you no more. For your mansions were the great ones of the earth. And it's continuous. So the parallel of this verses that I've read here it shows that the times that we are living in this Babylon, we are living in times of great wickedness, of unexplainable deception, where the powers of evil have gone in full force to deceive and to conquer the world. Isaiah says, for gross darkness covers the world and gross darkness covers the people. So if God doesn't redeem us from the times that we are in, many of us are going to be deceived. For the authorities and principalities of wickedness are working in full force to deceive and to conquer people. As we go on, what is this great deception of immortality? From the beginning, we saw that the devil asks Eve in the Garden of Eden, is it true that God says, if you eat, you shall not surely die? And he says, eat, it's okay, you will not die. So that is when it begins, is great deception. And in our days, we can also see that this deception is living. As we look into the movies we watch day in and day out, one of the things that they teach in these movies is that you shall not surely die. I remember when I was young, I used to like some of the Nigerian movies. You see that there's a woman who dies and then he comes back to take care of his children. This is the deception that the devil himself is preaching to our world, that 
There is an afterlife after you die, for you shall surely not die. And of course, even in our days today, in the Christian world, there is also the same teaching, purgatory. They teach, they teach of afterlife. They teach of a transition. His spirit is waiting for us to bring him home. These are the things that even are taught in the Christian world. What does God say about life and death? Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 9, it says, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, for they are dead. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. So that is it. If you die, you will surely die. There is no other place. If you die, you go and wait for the Lord. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 to 17. I like it from verse 13, but I'm going to start from 16 to 17. It says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of a command, with the voice of an archangel and the sound of a trumpet of God, and the dead which are in Christ. So if you die, you die. Another version I like, it says, for those who are asleep in Christ, it says, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So Revelation chapter 14, verse 18, the last one says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on, blessed indeed. So these verses, what are they saying to us? When you die, or those are relatives who have died, that they have surely died. There is no reward for them in this life we live. And we cannot communicate with them in any way. So one of the pillars of the Babylon or of our day deception is that we shall not surely die. But we understand that the Lord says when we die, we die. There is no reward for us when we die. And when we are dead, we are dead. So in conclusion, what do we need to stand against this, this great deception? I'm going to read again from Job 19, 25, 27. It says, for I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has thus been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will need, I shall see him. So what we need, we need the Redeemer who lives. What we need, we need to bury ourselves in what the Lord is teaching. What we need, we need to search for ourselves in the scripture. What is the Lord saying about death? Is it true that there is life after death? So my dear listeners, I say to you, yes, we have had many teachings about death and life. Take time and study for yourself. This is just a tip or a taste of what the Lord has said. Take time to see and to search what the Lord is saying to us about this deception. Is it true that my mother who is dead can speak to me? Is it true that my grandmother who is already dead can take care of me? What is the Lord saying? The Lord saying to us, if you are dead or you are surely dead, there is no afterlife. There is no purgatory. There is no transition into other life. If you die, you wait for the Lord. And if you have died in Christ, you shall be resurrected with him in new life. Amen. Elder, I give back to you. Amen. If you die in Christ, you shall resurrect to life eternal. I pray that we will be partakers of the first resurrection, but not in the second resurrection. If you look at the technological world, there are now chatbots that they use machine learning to create you know, when the people were alive. So they could bring your dead relative, your mom, your dad, to speak to you. You ask questions through the machine learning algorithms. That person is able to respond or answer. That dead person. So wow, so the Bible says the wows of the evil one, the tricks, the traps. There are so many, and they are catching almost everyone by surprise. How will you disprove that when science is giving it to you? But the Bible says, for the dead know nothing. Their memories are forgotten. And they have no part with the living again. They sleep. If there is any chatbot, then it should have been Lazarus. Because he was dead for four good days. And he was brought back to life. So he would have given us so much of what he saw. The Moses that he saw among others. Now that we are going to help us with the sun worship in the old Babylon and how that is playing out in the spiritual Babylon that we live in. Elder Michael, take over 
and help us. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to take us through the next lesson, Babylon, the center of sun worship. And I appreciate our previous speakers yeah. for the foundation they've laid. Also, I want to start this summary with a Bible verse from the book, Romans chapter 1, verse 25. Before, the question here is that what makes us want to worship things that are created instead of the creator even today? Romans chapter 1, verse 25. I read, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever? Amen. We can see in our daily activities that, as Brother Delight just said, we've transitioned the position of worshipping the God who created us, and we are even worshipping ourselves. This lesson is giving account on how a certain worship started. Being the largest planet in the sky, the one that their crops of food depended on for growth, it's no wonder that the sun became an object of worship. Maybe listeners will be confused, but I want to delve into the lesson proper. We know that Babylon, Assyria, Egypt, and Persia, if you look the book Ezekiel and Daniel, we will get to know that these are evidence of this in the histories of Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, and Persia. Ezekiel, the prophet of God, who lived during the time of Daniel, tried to discourage the Israelites from worshipping the sun. And it was often a problem for God's people. That's Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 16. We are told in his that there was a certain Roman emperor called Constantine, who was an avid worshipper of the sun. And he was able to convert this worship or transition this worship into the Christianity. And in order for his new religion to appeal to other sun worshippers in his territory, he decreed in 321 AD and that the day of worship would be on Sunday, the day of the sun. And with this law, all, all worships were to close on that day. We are told that this man called Constantine was able to change the day of worship since the Garden of Eden from that time to that period of Constantine, he was able to change the Lord's day of worship. This happened in the 321 AD. Based on this, we cannot conclude that this sun worship wasn't something that was implemented by God, but this was man-made. We can see from the Bible, from the beginning to Revelation, that anytime God was working with a certain group of people, the devil is also having a set of groups that he also used to be his pipeline or to be his tools. As I mentioned, the Constantine Emperor, the Roman Church, went along with this demand and much of the Christendom now uphold the tradition of Sunday being the day of worship. As the day Christ was resurrected, they are basing this, that Sunday was the day that the Lord or Jesus Christ resurrected. So it demands to be the day of worship. Even though the change is found nowhere in the scriptures, we can look at Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 16, and 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 5 and verse 11. There are some instances in the Bible where men of God or men were worshiping the, 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 the son. I want to read from the Bible and that will help us to get the understanding. The book Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 16, I read, And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the template of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs towards the temple of the Lord, and their faces towards the east, and they worshipped the sun towards the east. So we can see that this is sun worship that we are seeing today. It's not something that's just started. And as we know, anything that we are seeing now has a beginning and will definitely has an end. We are entreating listeners, viewers, that this summary that we are making or we are passing out on this channel 
shouldn't be the only way for you to base on argument. There are so many is, um, references that are this video that will help us to do further research. And you can also reach out to us to do any inquiries that you want. The lesson is telling us that this is the beginning of the sun worship. And today we are observing this. But behold, and we should be aware that our days are numbered on this earth. And whatever we are doing now, we are going to be accounted for. So let's try and abide with our Lord. Let's try and be with our Lord by observing his day of worship. There are so many instances that we can cite in the Bible history. But because of time, I will end it here. But I want to quote this from one scholar called Jane G. Fraser in his book called The Worship of Nature. I read, in ancient Babylonia, the sun was worshipped from immemorial antiquity. So meaning this was something that was going on already in the Babylonian time. And it may seem surprising, but at times Babylonian sun worship influenced the worship of God in the Old Testament. Believers, this is how this started, and this is how it has influenced men of God, men of today, and all of us. May the Lord help us so that we will get the meaning of whatever we are worshiping today. We will get how it started, where it will push us to. This is a big challenge that the lesson is throwing out for all of us. What we are worshiping. Are we worshiping the God himself who created us, or we are worshiping something that we find ourselves in the same category of the creation. May the Lord bless us and keep us. I believe we are inspired. And this calls for more or further research of the word of God. Edda, I would like to end it here. And all what I'm saying that may the Lord give us his divine insight of his word. Amen. 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 Look at the religious system that we have. Try to relate some of the symbols that they use with the element in heaven. Why are certain structures having the moon or the half moon? Why is there some, when they are celebrating the mass, they are celebrating the Lord's Supper, there is this round object like the moon. Have you found out why do you have the, the sun blades? In most of them, the secret societies, and even in, in Christianity, you see these symbols. If you want to study symbology alone, it opens your mind to know that these people are clandestinely doing something. They are hiding something from you that you don't know. Probe, please. Probe. And know why certain things and certain practices are taking place. Don't just swallow them. Don't just bow down to those things. Question those things. Question those practices and God will lead you to the truth. We will ask Brother Demian to help us to know the call to this commitment. The call to this commitment. Now that we know all these lies, what kind of commitment is the Lord calling us to? Brother Demian, take over. Thank you. Thanks, Ella. And to our listeners and viewers, we thank all the previous participants and presenters who have paved the way for what I want to say about Wednesday's lesson, a call to faithfulness. We see a lot of spiritism going on. We see a lot of idolatry going on. We see persons wanting to follow a way that seems right according to their conscience, as one presenter has said. But God is calling us to faithfulness and it's not based on our conscience. It is based on his word. The lesson on Wednesday reminds us that from Revelation 14, Revelation 17, Babylon is falling. This city of confusion, this religious system that represented the city of confusion in the past, is fallen. It has made the whole earth drunken. All these frogs that we heard about, these demons, working miracles to deceive people, which is why God mentions for us that we cannot look for signs to worship him because the devil can also perform signs. We have to be careful. We can't say, God, show me a miracle for me to know that you are true because the devil can show us miracles as well. And within all this conflict, God is still saying that you can be faithful to me. 
I can give you the power through the Holy Spirit to remain steadfast and committed in these last days when there's so many winds and doctrines out there that are deceiving people. He wants us to remain faithful. The powers of hell do not have to overcome us if we want to be faithful to him. We just have to remember what David says in Psalms 46 verse 1, that he's our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. But we have to seek that help. If we want that help, we have to seek that help. And how do we seek that help? We are reminded, John chapter 17, verse 17, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. We have to build our relationship with God based on his word. We were reminded from last lesson, we can't use the man-made traditions. We can't use these doctrines that are man-made and make vain the commandments or word of God. We have to stand on his word because when we make these commandments and traditions a part of our life and we abide by them, it is so easy for the devil to cause us to be deceived. As our Ella mentioned, some of these signs and symbols that are within some of these religious um, organizations represented by this false religious system are also in demonic organizations like the Illuminati and the Freemason. We cannot be looking like the world, so there must be a problem there. That's why God is saying here, focus on my word. He has given us all we need to his word to depend on him and to have the strength to overcome. The last presenter mentioned about idolatry. In the temple, we heard about persons facing the sun, worshiping the sun. And here on Wednesday, it mentions that if we from Ezekiel 20, verse 1 and 20, would understand that with all these abominations, all these abominable practices and pagan idolatry or idolatrous practices, would understand that these sun worship and other idolatrous practices are leading us away from God. And if we come back to his word and his word guides us about his Sabbath or about not um, believing in the immortality of the soul, it's not just about the Sabbath, brethren, but also the other false teachings. If we allow the word to teach us and guide us, as Ezekiel 20, verse 12 and verse 20 mentions, and I'll read them for you. Verse 12 says, Moreover, I have gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. And verse 20 says, And hollow my Sabbath, and they shall be a sign between me and you that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. These people would not be doing sun worship if they understood truly what the word says. We can't ignore the word and just follow a group of people who are doing what they want to do because this is a sign. How do we know it's a sign? It teaches us about God who is our creator and it teaches us about God who is our redeemer. And again, I remind us, brethren, that this is not just about coming out of the Babylonian system, which is setting up this false day of rest and abiding by God's true day of rest, because there are other teachings that you have to give up. So if you are abiding by God's true day of rest and you are a Sabbath worshiper, my brother, my sister, I'm still saying to you, you cannot believe in spiritism. You have to let the Bible teach you that when we die, we sleep. You cannot believe in other practices about purgatory. And when you die, you go to purgatory. You cannot believe that the Bible teaches that when you die, you go straight to hell or heaven because these are not doctrines of God based on his word. These are traditions and doctrines of men. God is saying to us right here in Ezekiel from this message that we do not have to partake in these pagan practices. We can remain faithful to him. But the main way for us to be faithful to him is that we have to study his word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. David mentions this to us in the Psalms. If we want truly, brothers and sisters, to remain faithful to God, to move away from these pagan practices of either sun worship, which causes us to be adoring and venerating a false day of rest, and to worship God on his true day of rest, we have to study his word. If we want to move away from the spiritism and all other practices and idolatrous and abominable practices, 
that are contrary to God's way and his will, we have to study his word for ourselves. Be like the Berians, brethren. They search the scriptures to know for themselves. Don't listen to your leaders only and just adapt what they say as gospel and don't search for yourself. You have to know for yourself, my brothers and sisters, so that you can be led into the truth. You can be guided by the Holy Spirit into all truth. That is what God wants you to do, not for a man or a woman, a leader of God who claims to be a leader of God to guide you into truth, but for the Holy Spirit who taught that same leader to teach you how to follow God through his word. I bring it back to Ella. Thank you for listening or watching. Amen. 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 Don't be hypnotized. Some have gone through hypnosis and they are failing to use the conscience that God has given them. Hypnotism is a very dangerous thing. Don't move by those emotions, the sensationalism, the feelings. I feel I no, that is not feelings will not save you. Emotions will not save you. Uh, those kind of false revivers will not save you. God gives us a grace to obey. And that's what our next speaker is going to help us. How does the grace of God help us? We're talking about we keeping the commandments. We're talking about we keeping the true Sabbath. We're talking about following the four steps of our Savior. How do we do this? But I think dry. Help us in a very biblical vision. Thank you. Ah, uh, thank you very much, Elder. Thursday now becomes the crowning of our lesson. Uh, Thursday says grace for obedience. We have heard about these deceptions, immortality. We have heard about the deception of the Sabbath. We have heard about the deception of the commandments. So what shall we do then? Revelation chapter 17 talks about a woman who's dressed in a scarlet and purple. And what is interesting with this woman, she's riding on a beast. Wow. And while she's riding on a beast, she has a cup of wine. And what she does with this cup of wine, she makes the nations to drink of this cup of wine. So I think we've already established these symbols in Revelations that a woman represents a church. So which church are we talking about? I'm going to say it. I'm sorry to those I'm going to offend. But the woman we are talking about, this is the Catholicism. The Catholicism. And the scarlet, it says here, it represents, if you go to the Catholicism, it represents the blood of the saints. And we've already established who is the beast. And the wine is the doctrine, the false doctrine, which is given to the people. So what was this false doctrine that they have preached or they have given to the people is that the law of God can be changed to the law of men. And instead, they have placed the Sunday as the day of worship instead of the Sabbath. And we see this many times the devil himself has repeated this day of Eleanor's teaching. So what does God say to us in this teaching or in this wine that has been given to us or many nations by the woman? It says here, I'm going to read from Revelation chapter 18, 4, 5. It says, then I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. The Lord is calling us today to come out of Babylon. He's calling us to come out of the city of confusion. He's calling us out to deny each and every deceptions that we have been hearing. And dear listeners, you might be wondering, we are here talking about the Sabbath. We want to call you to Adventism. To clear myself, we are not here to call you to Adventism, but we are calling you to come to the true worship of the Lord. We are not calling you to come to Adventists, no, but we are calling you to the true worship of the Lord, which is the worship of the Sabbath, among his other commandments. And he says here, how does it now define to us that many have sinned and have forgotten the worship or have not known the true worship of the Lord measuring in courts on the Sabbath? I'm going to read from John chapter 3, verse 4. What does God require to us? Or what? how does he divine sin? He says, John chapter 3, verse 4, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Romans chapter 4, verse 23, it says, but whoever has doubts is condemned. And if he eats because he is eating not from faith, underline this part. 
For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. If you don't do any action without faith, it is sin. You might be asking now, so what is faith? Faith, according to my own definition, it says faith is believing it is so because God has said so. You shall not steal, you shall not murder. If you do not observe what God has said, you don't have faith, you have sinned. And if you also look in Hebrews chapter 11, it also defines faith. It says, for faith is the substance of things seen, the evidence of things what? Not seen. This is faith. If we want to live a righteous life, we need to have faith in us. We need to have Christ in us, enabling to live a righteous life. I'm going to read what the author says from our quarterly. He says here, Sin is a transgression or the breaking of God's law. The only way anybody can obey the law is through faith in the power of living Christ. One of my favorite verses says, For I have been crucified with Christ. He says, For it's not only I who live, but Christ now is living in me. So when we want to have victory over sin, we have to have Christ himself living in us. He continues and says, For we are weak, fail, frail faltering, sinful human beings. By faith, when we accept Christ, his grace atones us for our past and empowers our present. It gives me much energy when I speak of this kind of faith because I understand my humanity. I understand my weaknesses. For in my weaknesses, if I invite Christ, if I accept Christ, then he empowers me to live for the present. He says here, he gives us grace and apostleship for obedience. This is what Christ does when you accept Christ. Regardless of what I know, what you need is to accept Christ. And then he empowers you. He teaches you what you need to know. Romans chapter 1 verse 5 it says, For through whom, through Christ, we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. So through Christ, we have received grace. And this grace has empowered us unto obedience. As I conclude, I would also tempted to read what the author has written for us here. It says, heavens appeal to his people in churches that do not respect and obey the law of God is to step out by faith. God is calling us in our different churches that we should step out of faith. We should come out of Babylon. His appeal to Adventists, to my fellow brothers and sisters who are listening, it says his appeal to Adventists in Sabbath keeping congregation is to forsake all self centered human attempts at obedience and live godly lives by faith in the grace of Christ. Some of us think we can, but it's a call that is coming to us that without Christ, you can never. Just like a car, without a driver, it can never drive itself. And I'm going to read from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 6. It says, Keep them and do them. For that will be your wisdom and your understanding in sight of the people who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. If we want the nations to see us, if we want God to be pleased with us, we are supposed to keep the law in its all fullness. I'm going to continue. It says, would have been a powerful witness to the world. Our faithfulness can be a powerful witness and help God people out of Babylon. I'm going to speak specifically to those who observe the law, including the Sabbath. Let your testimony be founded on Christ's faith. Let it be a guide to those who are still in Babylon. Yes, in Babylon, to those who are still, yes, navigating the truth about the Sabbath, God is calling you that you might come out of Babylon. Come out of Babylon and repent of your sins and accept his faith and accept him enabling you to live a righteous life. So may we be blessed with all this. Elder, I bring back to you. Amen. Thank you so much. If you love me, keep my commandments. He says, without me, you can do nothing. Then he continues. With Christ, all things are possible. You see the beauty and the poetry, how these words are just opposed. And you appreciate that it's not your strength, it's not by your power, it's not by your might, but by the spirit of the Lord. We are taking our summary and we're beginning with Brother Kapemba. What is the take-home message in one minute? Brother Kapemba, kindly take over. Uh, thank you very much, Elder. Viewers, my conclusion is, remember there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it is death. Let us be reading our Bibles and let us 
depend on the word of God for our survival. Thank you. So I want to tell our listeners and to all those who are listening and even to myself that when we die, we surely die. And only if we believe in Christ, if we die in Christ, then we shall be resurrected. And number two, my take-home message is that let us come out of Babylon. Let us anchor our faith in Christ and what he has taught us through the Bible, from which we are only going to be saved if we believe in Christ. Amen. Brother Demian, what is the take-home message before Brother Michael comes? In our society, my brothers and sisters, some persons think that there are forms of truth, but there can be only one truth because... Isaiah says that our righteousness is like filthy rags. No one is righteous apart from God. So there's only one truth, which is in God. And if we want to know what that truth is, since we are desirous of following him, we have to allow his word to sanctify us to his truth. As the other presenters have said, let us cling to his word. Let us study his word. Let us make his word a part of our lives. Let us build our faith upon his word through grace so that he can guide us out of these abominable acts, these idolatrous acts, and then we can worship him on his true day of rest. And we can worship him based on his true doctrines, not man-made doctrines. Amen. Amen. Brother Michael, kindly give us your concluding remarks. Yeah, please take over. Thank you. All right. All has been said. And my message for our listeners is that by listening to God, rather than these exceptions, we can still find comfort in knowing that we rest, will definitely be resurrected again. When Jesus returns, it is not too late for me to be at the right position. We are blessed ever so more on the day God himself has blessed us. Let us worship him in truth and in spirit. John 4, 24 and 25. May the Lord bless us all. Amen. Amen. Let us worship the Lord in truth and in spirit. Let me give you my take-home message. Then we invite Elder Demian to pray for us and our viewers. There are three areas where the Bible mentions miracles, signs, and wonders that will mimic God. And that is what Matthew talked about, that the devil will use. And he saw those miracles routed whenever God delivers his people, whenever salvation is preached. In Acts chapter 2, verse 22 to 23, we saw the then apostolic church when they were empowered by the Holy Spirit, how they were moved. The same thing with 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. And when God delivered his people at the shores of the sea, and they sang the song of Moses. We are going to sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Remember that Sabbath day, which is the seventh day, I always say you can choose to worship any other day provided it is the seventh day of the week. We have to remember that is in strong controversy with Sunday Sabbath institutions and Sunday sacredness. I mentioned some of the elements that the devil is using in our contemporary society to drive home that agenda, even if possible to coerce people to worship on this fourth day. Sabbath is a memorial, it's a sign of sanctification, deliverance from slavery of sin, and a holy day of convocation and rest in the Lord, as we saw it practiced in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 3. Jesus did it when he was on earth in Luke chapter 4, verse 16. The apostles did it, including Paul in Acts chapter 17, verse 2. The dividing line between secular and sacred time is Friday night at sunset. And I told you that at that time, the only practical way, the only unflinching principle that can explain the weekly cycle is the Sabbath, which God instituted after his creative work. The Sabbath of the old is the Sabbath of the new. 
the Sabbath that was given to God's people at creation is the same Sabbath that he himself honored in the New Testament. The seventh day, Saturday Sabbath. You might think it's tautology, but I'm repeating that. The seventh day, Saturday Sabbath is what the Lord has what? Has ordained. He has sanctified. He has made holy. He has blessed it. And no one can substitute it. Even if the devil may attempt, he will never succeed. God will have still remnant people who will stand for the truth, though the heavens will fall. The seductive deception of the Jewish leaders and the people and their burdensome practices and their restrictions resulted in 39 extra regulations on the Sabbath commandment alone. And then 613 additional human customs and traditions. That is why the Sabbath became better. And that's what Christ corrected. It wasn't regarding the day. It wasn't regarding the sacrament. It was these false theologies, these human customs, human traditions that Christ tried to correct, but they did not go in sync with him. They did not agree with him because they were so drunk with those old wines that when he tried to give them new wine, when he tried to give them undiluted wine, unfermented wine, they vehemently rejected and they ended up crucifying him. Remember, don't look for the most popular way, convenient way, or via political correctness, but let us look for the Bible way. It is possible to observe or keep the Sabbath in today's competitive industrial society. Though there is a temporary economic manipulation of Saturdays to our perils, remember also that without love, Sabbath keeping, including all the laws, will be mechanical and miserable. But commandment keeping should be delight and relational. I pray that God will help us to know and be able to come out of this false system and give true worship to the curator, not worshiping the beast, not receiving it marked or going by it details. I will ask Edda Brown to pray for us and pray for our viewers, those who are watching us live and those who will be watching later. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your wonderful words of life that we have reviewed, that we have discussed. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you will help us to remain faithful to your words. In these last days, there are so many deceptions that Satan has, so many traps, plans that he has for your people, for those who are trying to follow you on this narrow path, and for those, Lord Jesus, who are trying to seek some answers to life. He doesn't want them to see your light. He wants them to remain in the darkness. But we pray, Lord, for those who will view, who have already viewed, who will listen or who have already listened to this broadcast, that you will guide them into your truth. May they be reminded as the memory verses. Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. And those, Lord Jesus, who want to be free will be free indeed if they will just allow your word to sanctify them. So we pray, Lord, that as you open up the guilt in the practices of our life, Lord Jesus, and help us to understand that some things we are doing are false. May we not stay within these things, these practices. May we come out of Babylon because Babylon is fallen, Lord. And may we allow your grace to guide us, Lord Jesus, into this marvelous light. Thank you again for your words. Thank you for the presenters who have made themselves available to study your words. And we just pray that it will not fall on deaf ears. It will not fall on soil that will not grow and multiply 50-fold, 100-fold. But your Holy Spirit will constantly speak to their hearts. Bid them, Lord Jesus, to surrender to you, Lord. We pray these mercies in Jesus' holy name with the forgiveness of our sins. Amen. 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 Revelation chapter 14, verse 9 and 10. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out 
without a mission to a cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. There are two marks. There are two signs. Whether you are receiving the mark of the beast or you are receiving the mark of Christ. Join us next week as we dissect this lesson. The seal of God and the mark of the beast. There are so many nuggets that it's been divided into part one, uh, two, and God, we shall bring you the part one of it, the seal of God and the mark of the beast. People have come out with various theories that do not go in sync with the Bible. What is the Bible perspective? What does the Bible say when it comes to the seal of God and the mark of the beast? The same time next week on the same network with the same team, May the Lord watch between us as we absent one from another, and I will say, Mispa. Covers my sin each time I come.